Good evening and uh, welcome to our uh, last policy pizza and pint of the year. Uh, we'll be back again in September, but uh, thank you for coming out for uh, this evening's event, uh, Politics in Manitoba, the year in review. Uh, my name is Robert Erbel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. Manitoba Institute for Policy Research's goal is to strengthen public policy discourse in our province by facilitating dialogue and debate on important issues facing Manitobans and their governments. Our policy beats in a pint events here at the Winnipeg Free Press Cafe are designed to have our panelists situate and discuss important public policy issues that face the province and engage with you, the audience, in an informal manner. Tonight's topic um, is about the politics year review. Um, it's been a busy year for commercial politics and uh, for most of us, with all the daily demands, we don't always have an opportunity to keep up on it. So we've asked a group of uh, crack reporters to come out and uh, keep us informed on what's happening, to share what they think are the highlights, to uh, tell us what we've missed, what they maybe missed, and uh, allow you to have a discussion and a dialogue about it going forward. Our panelists this evening are Mary Agnes Welch. She's the public policy reporter at the Winnipeg Free Press. She's also moderated many of these events in the past, and we're excited to have her on the panelists, the panelists this time tonight. <laughs> Next, we have Steve Lambert, who is a Winnipeg-based reporter for the Canadian Press. He also serves as president of the Manitoba Legislature Press Gallery. Wow. And the final member of our panel is Richard Cluche. Richard Cluche is the news director at 680 CJOB, where he is also assistant brand director and co-host Winnipeg's Morning News Weekday Mornings. <laughs> our moderator tonight is Dr. Royce Koop. Dr. Koop is an assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Studies at the University of Manitoba. And uh, with the great turnout this evening, uh, thank you all for coming. You guys make up the big part of the evening and we look forward to the discussion. So uh, at the end of the evening, if you can fill the feedback forms, uh, topics, things would be better, let us know. And uh, enjoy the evening, I'll pass the mic, well I'll pass the mic, I'll let Steve use his mic and he can get things going. Thank you and enjoy. Thanks, uh, we've been asked to sort of go over quickly, uh, go over quickly some of the big news events. You're all politically engaged, so we're gonna try to offer some new information that you might not have heard before, but we'll start with a, a brief uh, overview of some of the uh, bigger stories of the last uh, 12 months or so in management politics. Um, the biggest one, I think, by consensus would have to be, sorry, am I not holding this close enough? Yeah, there we go. Um, you gotta kiss it, Steve. <laughs> don't be doing this. Um, the biggest story uh, uh, by far, I think, was the uh, raise in the provincial sales tax that occurred just a little bit over a year ago. But uh, as we saw, the fight sort of continued into this year. We've got a court case on it now. And it's a battle for the hearts and minds of Manitobans between the political parties as to whether this is a good thing, uh, raising needed money for infrastructure, or whether it's uh, wasted money that will take money out of the economy, uh, hurt Manitobans through their spending ability, and perhaps uh, money that could be obtained through their spending restraint. Um, as we saw, there was some confusion initially. There was a bit of a confusing message from the government over what the increase in sales tax was for. Was it to preserve frontline services? Uh, we said at one point it was for playgrounds and things, and then they refocused their message in the fall of the cabinet shuffle, came with the message that it's for uh, core infrastructure, highways, anti-flood uh, protection, that sort of thing. Uh, they came up with an um, economic policy that, uh, sorry, somebody's trying to get my attention? A little closer? Yeah, okay, that's good, yeah. very close. Um, <laughs> they came up with an economic study earlier this year that said it would create 59,000 jobs. It was actually first years of employment. And as we saw in Ontario, Tim Hudak really got skewered for mixing those two. Uh, the damage here does not seem to be uh, so far uh, as great. Um, there was also some uh, controversy because the then finance minister, Stan Struthers, uh, said the government had never even looked at 9%, uh, never ran the numbers on it. Uh, we later learned uh, that wasn't true. Another big story, um, the, the Christine Melnick, the NDP, punted somebody from caucus for the first time in uh, recent memory. Um, this goes back to 2012. There was uh, a few hundred people 
most of them publicly funded immigrant service agency workers who took an afternoon off to come down to the legislature. And over the course of a year and a half, we slowly got somewhere near the truth through journalists digging, through a fairly thorough examination by the ombudsman, through a pretty relentless pursuit by the opposition. Um, we, we now know most of what went on. We still don't know the truth as to who was involved in the decision to use bureaucrats to invite publicly funded people to come down to the legislature for what we were initially told was sort of a spontaneous thing, but it later turned out it was an orchestrated attempt for a, a political show of support. Um, other stories, I'm going to run through these others pretty quickly. Uh, Radical Carey, uh, elected as Liberal uh, leader. The Liberals are now up in the polls. Uh, we've seen this before on occasion. We don't know how soft that is. We've seen the Liberals jump up between elections before and then sort of crater election time. Um, the grounding of stars, uh, the stars helicopter service, that was another big story. Um, why is stars used far less here in Manitoba than it is in Alberta and Saskatchewan? Uh, why are our ground services being used more here than, than elsewhere? Um, and I think that's about it. Gaffs, I think we'll talk about gaffs later. Mm -hmm. She's smiling, I'm gonna pass it to her. Actually, hang on to that one, I'll grab this one. Hi, uh, so Steve is running through uh, some of the big stories that were even kind of a refresher for me because I felt like this, this session was, you know, not the most exciting session uh, we've had despite the PST, sort of the ongoing PST controversy, but there's some good things to remember there. The thing I wanted to mention, um, uh, sort of looking at a higher level um, of things, one of the things that really struck me this session, and I, I don't know if it, I feel like it's worse, I'm pretty sure it's worse, um, is sort of the, how can I put it, how much the NDP have taken uh, a page from the federal conservative playbook uh, when it comes to completely, relentlessly demonizing, uh, ironically enough, the provincial conservatives. Um, I think we saw this in the last election. Actually, there was a terrific bit of research done. Uh, Andrea, did you do that research? Where's Andrea? Yeah, I, in a book that Andrea Rounce uh, co-edited about just how negative the last provincial campaign was and how effective uh, the NDP sort of negative attack ads on Hugh McFadden were in that election. It really was the most negative provincial campaign we've ever seen. And that has continued. Um, and really the NDP, for all, of their, uh, for all of their sort of traditional sort of positioning of themselves as the compassionate group, the political party that wants to improve discourse, that's sort of gentlemanly and uh, compassionate, they've actually been incredibly effective at continuing that demonization. And, and really, I mean, everything that the Tories do federally, the NDP does provincially. They, in question period, they are incredibly, like, enragingly focused on their talking points. Um, you know, and I, I remember listening just not long ago to question period. Uh, we don't barely go anymore to question period to sit in the gallery. You might be, do you even go anymore? I, like, yeah, like we, we barely go. We sit and listen on the speaker boxes um, at the ledge office. And I remember just sitting in the ledge office listening and hearing reasonable, well thought out questions to Aaron Selby, for example, and Aaron Selby just over and over stepping back into the, well, you fired a thousand nurses, you fired a thousand teachers. Um, you know, I think maybe the most egregious one was even in estimates, which is traditionally a much, I don't want to say less partisan, but more, um, so, uh, some genuine information is given in estimates uh, from when, when the opposition asks questions um, and the, the, you know, the, the governing party answers more fulsomely. Even in estimates, Aaron Selby and many others sort of degenerated into all of those, those just those boring talking points that dredge up the 1990s. Um, and in that case, uh, it was actually the Winnipeg Sun that took her to task. She talked about um, uh, the surgical, the pediatric surgery uh, scandal and the death of, I think it was a dozen children in the 80s. Um, and which was just, I mean, it was just even beyond the pale. So, and, and that's what the federal Tories do in question period. Federal question period is now just painful to watch because even just the, the, the surface uh, 
even just the, like the, even the most lame attempts to answer questions are no, it's no longer being done. And the NDP are doing that provincially. Um, it's worse than I've ever seen it. They are meddling with FIPAs. They, there is political interference and way less stuff being released under access to information. We saw the Do Good White People uh, story was an example of that. Mel, the Melnick um, situation, there was an example of a, you know, a couple of access to information requests where stuff clearly ought to have been released that wasn't. Um, classic federal Tory. Um, and, and of course, the anti pallister um, uh, flyers and, and TV commercials that are out that are of marginal veracity. Um, and that, that, is, that is the exact tactic that the federal conservatives uh, used with less success against Justin Trudeau and against liberal leaders before him. So I'm really struck by, and this is maybe naive of me, I, I really, I, I don't know why it should surprise me, this is the way politics is done now, and why should the NDP be any different? And they would say, well, if we aren't that way, we will lose, and you know, hell will freeze over and the sky will fall and Brian Pallister will revert to the 1990s. Nobody wants that. Um, whether that's true or not, it remains to be seen. But, um, but so they would say it's like doing bad in order to do good, ultimately. But I just, I'm really surprised at the, the decline in the level of discourse in Manitoba, especially in a province that does tend to like civility and centrism and reasonableness and gentlemanliness. Um, and that has, that I think has gotten worse this session as the polls are worse and things get, you know, a little bit more desperate for the NDP. Um, and, and I think we'll see that in the next, what are we, two, oh God, we're two years out from an election. I feel like an election is looming, but I have to keep reminding myself we're two years out. So, uh, so actually maybe next session will be more interesting. So that's the, that's the key observation I wanted to make about this last year at the legislature, and I'm, I'm a little bit more removed from it than, than Steve because I'm not there every day at all. I do sort of like pop in and out nowadays, um, but maybe because I'm a bit more removed from it, I've been struck by just how, just how Machiavellian uh, the provincial party, provincial NDP have gotten, and it, it might work. So maybe there's a reason for it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, what Mary Agnes might call Machiavellian, others would call sound political strategy. Um, like many of you, uh, I was once kind of sitting where you were. The, the professors and the, 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 the former and current uh, government and opposition members in the, in the audience here aside, the students here, uh, some 25 years ago, I would attend these things, and I prided myself on knowing, uh, I think, an alphabetical order. This is how much a geek I was. I could name all the members of the Manitoba Legislative Assembly uh, 25 years ago. I think I'd be hard-pressed to name 20 right now. Uh, and here I'm a guy that's supposed to be involved in the news gathering and some of the decision-making processes. Um, Steve's on top of it every day at the legislature. Mary Agnes pops in, I pop in as well. Um, I've had the, the luxury of, uh, in, in, in the position that I've had uh, recently as news director, but before as the morning talk host, um, access to, to several premiers and, and to their, their kind of their top, um, their top people over the years. Uh, I would observe in the, in the last year, maybe the last two years, um, we've seen a government that is still focused on trying to recover from raising the PST. Um, I would always suggest that you look at history of politics to kind of give you cues as to what's going on right now. And I remember having, um, having lunch with Gary Dewar, who was then the opposition leader, uh, and he was talking about the fact that he had one more kick at the can at being Premier, uh, and if I don't win this time, I'm done. And he talked about keeping uh, the eye on the ball all the time, and, and that really was keeping the eye on the economy. Because the New Democrats were always seen as not being able to um, maintain the, the finances of good, hardworking Manitobans. And he was completely and totally focused on that during the, the latter part of the film in government in his first first term to prove to Manitobans that they could take care of the public purse. So I think the fatal error that 
that Greg Selinger made was not remembering what Gary Dewar did in opposition and uh, while he was in government. Um, because he prided himself on being better than the other guys when it came to finances in Manitoba. And he had a finance minister, Greg Selinger, that, that got that reputation. So I, I'm still amazed at the decision that they made over raising the PST. Not that they didn't need the money, but just the political tactic behind it. Because there they ignored history. And if you look at the history of Manitoba politics, and I think, I think there's a, a few people in this room that, that know their history a lot better than I do, there are things that repeat themselves. So we're in an era of politics right now, two years out from an election, where Pallister will take every opportunity to remind the folks, uh, the average Manitobans, that uh, we are the people that can handle the finances properly and will remind you who raised taxes and now they have a series of hydro ads. And the NDP are at a point now where they're reminding people of the cuts of the 90s, etc. So I'll be fascinated to see what happens in the next year. And I have some thoughts for later as to what could happen, behind, what's happening behind the scenes and what could happen, uh, whether or not Selinger stays or not. I think he'll stay, but there might be a push. But I look at this past year, and even a government that has raised taxes is still cash-strapped. And, you know, it's interesting, we talk about some of the main stories, but how many times have we actually talked about a legislative agenda, where there is uh, pieces of legislation that are to deal with some of the, 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 the problems, uh, to make life easier, to, to, to do things that government is all about. And there are some consumer pieces of legislation that kind of connect with people, but a lot of it is housekeeping. So when the house is in session then, you have question period where you're just trying to run out the clock because there's not a lot of substantive issues to talk about. And I think that contributes to the disconnect that people outside this room have with politics is that it's really about running off the clock to the next election. And while there are people I know who in government who are very, very good at what they do and want to change their little part of the world in the interest of making this a better place to live, play, and work, there are others that are just kind of saying, you know, how do we get through, how do we get to Friday? And we end up in the media covering a lot of the stories about getting to Friday. Whereas I wish we could have this honest debate as where we're going as a province. You know, what are we doing to solve some of the problems of income inequality? Something that you've spent a lot of time on. What are we doing to save Lake Winnipeg? Um, and and I, I, I've, I've grown to be somewhat cynical of the machine to the point now where I will read polling data and people don't really give a rat's ass about government. And that's the big problem that, at some point, we need to discuss. So I look at the legislative agenda and I say, well, there's some interesting stories there that can kind of get maybe 24, 48 hours feed the news cycle. I see the game stuff that goes on as far as, you know, whether or not uh, Selinger's going to bounce back in the polls. And I do want to talk to you about this a little bit later as far as what's going on behind the scenes. But then I see the stories that we try to break and it's the gotcha stuff, but in the end, none of it, I think, resonates with the public. You know, we spend a lot of hours saying, ah, gotcha, but, you know, fix the damn potholes, do, you know, you know don't raise my taxes, and that's why I think the, the, the PST is symbolic for a government that has really lost um, its connection to how they can maintain power. Now, will they recover? They just might because the other guys are not doing what they need to do to be the government in waiting. So I'll stop at that point.